Hallelujah. We're in the third lesson of Second Thessalonians. In the first two lessons, we finished the first two verses. So we did finish one lesson per verse, average. The first one was more introduction, and the second one was doing the greeting. And so this is the third one, and I'm not sure how far we're going to go. We may get through three, four, and five. It's probably a fair shot at doing that. And uh, let me see, do I even have six on my notes? Nope, I had no faith to get the six. Now, some of what I'm going to do today kind of carries over in your notes from last week. And remember the last week I didn't finish all my notes. And so I just copied and pasted what I didn't finish from last week onto this week. So what was point three or four last week is now point one as we start over with... Uh, Point one seems like the right place to start, so I just renumbered, but the outline's about the same. I don't think I did anything with the first one or two sections, but I felt like I wanted to cover them again, and I want to go back to verse three of the second, of the first chapter of the second letter to the Thessalonians. This letter has really attracted me because it feels like there's a little bit of an echo. I don't know if we could do anything with that or not. It doesn't matter. But uh, this letter, do you hear the echo? If you don't know what to do with it, that's fine. Let it echo. This letter is written by Paul to the church in Thessalonica. It is written to what we closed and now close again, an exceptional church, a good church, a model church, a church that if we were to be compared to some church, I would want to be compared to There's various churches, but this is definitely one of them I would want to be compared to as a church. This is a church who went through a lot. This is a church that lived in a non-Jewish society. They had no synagogue. They had no priests. They had no Sanhedrin. They had no Pharisees. Oh, poor people. But they were nevertheless, as all people are, a religious people. And so Paul came and Paul, Silas, and Timothy came into this city. And we studied this in the first letter. And they introduce the concept of the one or of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They introduce the person of Jesus Christ. And we know that they were introducing he, the Lord in contrast to the Roman gods or the Greek gods that they served. And we know that they were seen as... Uh, kind of foreigners, pagans, to their religion. And we know that they stirred up somewhat of a hornet's nest with those who did not want to receive the gospel, the message of Jesus. And they stirred up to kill Paul and to have him arrested, and they had uh, intent to harm him. And so the apostle... And you could even say the three apostles, but Paul, Silas, and Timothy basically were run out of town after a while with them. We don't know exactly how long, but, you know, at least estimates are at least a year there. And in the time they were there, they taught, they presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had people respond to it. They taught the, the uh, kind of the doctrines of theology of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were maturing the church and they were exposing the fallacies or the deceptions of the Roman gods, the Greek gods, the religions, and why they were not real. And people were converting from, you might say, the social mores or norms of religion of that place to Christianity, as it was now called after Antioch. And they were responding and they were growing. And the Jews came, or the, 
In fact, the first two mission uh, travels of Paul, the Jews, the Orthodox Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, made it a point to always send a group of people to wherever he went and to stir the people against them. And of course, they were driven by the enemy of the gospel. They were driven by the enemy of the Christian. They were driven by the enemy of the Lord, of Satan and his horde of demons. And they would take their people and they would, from a Jewish standpoint, stir up people against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then you would have the non-Jews who were traitors or practicers or in some way profited from the religions of Rome, the Greek and Roman gods. And when they began to lose position and they began to lose authority and power in society, because we know all men, they're after money, power, position. And when the gospel robs by exposing the deception, the lies, those men of those three things, they get mad. And so they had run Paul out. And after about a year, Paul sent Timothy back to see how the church was doing. And the church was thriving. Paul was afraid that the church had shut down and was no longer in operation. But he was joyful to find out that the church was thriving. The church was growing. Uh, the church was beginning to meet in cell groups and houses, in uh, groups, leaders were being trained. And so once Timothy came back, Paul wrote the second letter, which we're studying now, which we covered the introduction of the greetings the last two weeks. And so today we're going to pick up again in verse 3. And I kind of went through this last week, but it's so connected to 3, 4, and 5 that I feel like I want to cover it again and then connect it to that which we haven't covered today. So would someone read verse 3 for me, please, because I didn't get that far in third grade. All right, read that again a little slower. You're too fast for me. All right, slow down a little bit more and stop at the commas. All right, thank you. I couldn't have done better. Paul is saying we ought always to give thanks for you, or thanks to God for you, brothers. He had good reason. Paul felt like he had good reason to thank God on this, for this church because he saw fruit. His effort wasn't wasted. His life was not lost. The gospel of Jesus Christ was not destroyed. The move of God, the Holy Spirit, and the creation of the church of God had found a Gentile home where it was not based on the Old Testament. It was not based on the laws. It was not based on Moses. It was not based on the prophets. It was not based on King David and the history. It was not based on the nation of Israel. The gospel here was as clean, pure, a virgin of a, gos of a gospel presented in a land. So it had every kind of probability to not succeed. But as we remember in Romans 1.16, I think it is, it, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is what? The power of God unto salvation. And I'm really encouraged and want you to be encouraged that the gospel of Jesus Christ does not depend on our skill. How many of you guys consider you yourselves a really good salesperson? Man, you can talk uh, Eskimo into buying a, a glass of ice. Anybody? <laughs> How about you're just really persuasive? 
but you're just really a good public speaker. Well, thank goodness you don't need that for the gospel. How many of you guys consider yourselves great theologians, learned in the scripture, ready to teach the teachers? All right. One. The babes will lead. How many of y'all have some fear, trepidation, uncertainty, insecurity when you talk to somebody else about the fact that you're a Christian? All of us probably have some sense of insecurity. Well, the good thing, the good news is you have to be led of the Spirit of God. He will touch you. He will spur you. He will... Say, hey, why don't you talk to him about your experience with me? And you just share your story. And then you weave into that. Does anybody in here not know one verse? John 3.16. Anybody not know John 3.16? That's good enough. You, you blend in the word of God some way, somehow into your testimony and then you just release it. And if you do that, have you been successful? Did you see victory? Hector? Yes? What if they said no? And what if they rejected you and called you some hypocrite or some other nasty goody two-shoe type of name. <laughs> what if they reject everything? What if they push you, spit on your face? Is that the stupidest thing I ever heard? What if they say, that's it? That's all you got? Ain't that what we fear? The gospel is the power of God. It is the spoken word of God. So Paul was ecstatic that the gospel had broken into a Gentile city, a Gentile society with religions that didn't have anything to do with the foundations of Christianity, which was the Old Testament and the first covenant, they didn't have to understand anything of that. They had to experience by the Spirit of God that what these men were saying was somehow validated in their spirit. They had to know the name of Jesus who claimed to be the Son of God. And he says, I give thanks for you, brothers. On behalf of the church, I give Thanks to God, he said, you, my, believe, my brother, believers, are the cause for my happiness, for my thanksgiving. And in fact, Paul says, uh, we ought always, we ought, we're obligated. It is right to give thanks for you. It is as if I have a debt to God to give thanks for you. I owe God thank you for you. Now look around the room and think, I have a debt. I owe God thanks for, what's that man's name with the glasses back there? Michael, Michael? I owe a debt of thankfulness to God. When I met him, he walked in and said, I want to join this community. I have a debt of gratitude. I feel I owe God. Thank you for that man. Up until, I don't know, when, how long you've been with us now? Man, how do I live 68 years without you? I guess 67, 66 years without you. I don't know. So 
Somebody else filled in, maybe. We have a debt of thankfulness to God that we're not alone, that our faith is not kind of an exception, that our relationship with Jesus Christ is not isolated. But in fact, we are family. We are bound together. We are strong. We validate one another. He said, I thank God I ought, I ought always to give thanks for you. Now, honestly, when's the last time you prayed and you said, Lord, I owe you thanks for Vanessa being my sister in, in you. Lord, I owe you thanks for Brandy. When's the last time we pray with that focus that we are so intertwined, so connected, so dependent relationally together to one another? Paul was, uh, Paul was obligated, as is right, I ought to give thanks over an owed debt to you, God, for my brothers in Thessalonica. And he says, and I give thanks for their faith. And the concept in the Greek is exceeding faith. And so I look around the room and I say, who has exceeding faith? Who stands out when times get tough? Who always seems to have a word? Who always seems to say, I don't know, I'm just going forward. I can't stop. I just showed up. I don't know what I was doing. I just opened my mouth and spoke. I love Paula's testimonies. She said, I don't know what I'm doing. See, I get lost driving to Austin. And yet, out on the corner, there's these people undressed acting stupid and weird. And I'm just on my way to an appointment. And she can hear the voice of God says, go talk to them. That's weird enough. I give thanks that somebody hears the voice of God. And then I really give exceeding thanks that by the time she figured out what she ought to do and she was lost, she goes, I don't even know how to get back there, Lord. And then she's driving around a little bit, looks up, goes, oh, I'm back there. Gotcha, that's all right, I know the way. And so she goes back and she parks the car and she walks however far it was from the car to the corner. Had you, did you already work out your speech between the car and the first person you came to? Did you have it all planned out? No, of course not. What do you say to screaming people who are topless? What do you say to people who are angry at your, the God you, you're showing up to talk about? I give thanks, exceeding thanks for your faith. And even as two people get in a physical fight over the name of Jesus Christ, Paula just sits down and starts praying. She didn't referee. She didn't say stop. She just surrendered herself to the Lord. I give exceeding thanks for your faith, my brothers. Because first, I give thanks for you. Second, I give thanks for your faith. Or maybe I'd say third, for your exceeding faith, because that really encourages me. Fourth, I give thanks that it keeps growing. You are not the same people I met three and a half months ago, Michael. You're not the same person. Paul is not the, first per the person I met when I first met her. When I first met her, I made her mad. Now she loves me, hallelujah. 
You're not the same. I give thanks to God that you're growing in your faith and in the grace of God. In fact, he says, because your faith is growing abundantly, exceedingly, like weeds in the yard. You just show more weeds than grass. It just pops up everywhere. How do you do that? We learn to trust God more consistently, more extensively into our life as we grow in Christ. And I wrote in section one, letter G, faith is not a static thing. Or maybe I could have written, is not a static life. Faith grows. If you have faith, it will grow. You can't control it. You can't maintain it. You can't squash it. You can't cut the roots. Faith grows in us. It is made that way by God the Holy Spirit. It is willed that way by God the Father. It is given to us by God the Son. And so it's not dependent on you if you are a child of God and if you are being steadfast and faithful in your faith or in your uh, commitment to pursuit of God, your faith must grow. There's no such thing as faith of God that is static, dead, doesn't grow. Faith is always growing. Now, that may not describe our life, but then that means that we're not walking in the grace and faith of Jesus Christ. But if we're walking in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to grow. Hallelujah. That's called sanctification. That's the, by the command of God. That's what we're expected to do. Of my four brothers, I think, if I remember right, and I could be wrong, but I'll, I'll claim like I know what I'm talking about. Because y'all don't know any different. I think I remember my mom said that I was the smallest physically by weight of my three other brothers that were born. I ended up being the biggest afterwards. I had a lot of catch up to do. I did not have to make a plan to grow. I just did. I am not today who I was at birth or at four years old, hallelujah, by 10, 12 years old, I was the worst kid in elementary. Praise God, I'm not that kid either. By junior high, I was even worse than elementary in my out of control stupidity. Praise the Lord, I grew past that. You're going you're gonna to grow if you're a son and daughter of God. You're going to grow. You're going to grow. You don't have to take that bottle of Christian miracle. You must eat of this and drink of the Spirit of God, and you're going to grow. Our relationship grows with the Lord Jesus Christ. It grows or it decreases depending where our eyes are set, depending where our heart is turned. It's always moving. You can't be static. There's no neutral place. There's this concept that there's this path. We're climbing upwards to the mountain of God, as it were, the hill of God, I think, whatever it's called in Psalm 24. And that somewhere along the way, there's a bench with a nice big tree underneath and a fountain of pure, filtrated Ozark, Ozarka water. And we just sit down there as long as we want to do and drink. And, oh, and there's a snack machine that's free and you can snack and you can drink. And you can just even lay down on the bench and take a nap. And you can be there as long as you want to. And then when you're ready, you, you get on your walk again. That doesn't exist. 
Rather, it's like a slippery slope. You're either climbing, fighting forward, or you're sliding back down. The Thessalonians' relationship with God was developing, and so was their relationship with each other. Because if you grow in the Lord, you'll grow with each other. If you're thankful for the Lord, you'll be thankful for each other. If you owe a debt to the Lord, you owe a debt to each other. James 2, 14, 17. Somebody want to look that up. It says, genuine faith in the Lord is always accompanied with change. And in this case, with action, love action for one another. So somebody read out loud for me, James 2, 14, 17. If you have it, stand up. If not, I'll read it because I'm there. Okay, yes, sir. 2, verse 14 through 17. I almost want to read it. What good is it, my brothers, if you say you have faith, but you do not have any works? Can your faith save you? If a brother is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and you say to him, go in peace, be warm, be filled, without giving them anything needed for the body, what good are you? That's what I really want to read. What good are you? Faith by itself. If it does not have works, means you're dead. Paul was just saying, I'm rejoicing with your faith. Somebody give me a quick definition of faith, Sue. All right, what, what, somebody, define that belief for me. Somebody's walking across a, uh, a, a rope uh, from one end to the other and you get on his back because you have faith that he will make it and you will be alive as well. It's commitment. Faith is commitment to what you know is true. You can't help but do it. I mean, you can't be stupid, I guess. If I say, hey, I got a $10 bill, and I give it to anybody who has a nickel, a quarter, a dime. And you don't believe it and you don't do it. And then the next guy says, I'll do it. And then he does it. You go, oh, man. It's acting on what you know is true. Paul expressed concern that they keep increasing. It's kind of like I exhort you. Your love for one another should increase. Your debt for one another should increase. And what Paul was saying to us is that in Thess the Thessalonian church, their faith and their love was growing at a rate not normal in other churches. I think that I don't read this story in the Corinthian church. I think that there are churches that are really struggling, fighting, destroying one another, Laodicea, where they are not experiencing this kind of faith growing abundantly, where they love, their love for each other is without ceasing, increasing. And as I wrote, the last thing I wrote in section one, this was an exceptional church. And then I put in my head, Lord, I would want you to be able to say that about us. You and me. 
that we are an exceptional church. But then I have to measure against the issues brought up here of faith continuously increasing and demonstrated in how we're loving each other. Someone raise your hand. And, oh, she's stupid. I don't want to hear what you're going to say. Oh, he don't know nothing. Don't act like he don't, you don't see him. That's what I see happen in most circles. This is an exceptional church. Let's read verse 4. Because they are an exceptional church, because they have a, a, an abundant faith, and it is increasing in how they love each other, that's therefore. That's the connection. So somebody read that. persecutions and in the affliction that you are uh oh did I just say I want us to be this church <laughs> now we know how they increase their faith now we know how they're growing in their love for one another you know what if a horrific ice storm just came to you right now and just locked down the door, just froze everything shut and put a layer of ice across the street that you couldn't even walk to your car without falling and just shut everything down. And it just kept falling and just kept falling and the ice grew from one inch to two inch to three inch to four inch thick everywhere on the walls and the ground and the roads and everything got shut down and this is Wednesday night and here we are at 8 o'clock and we're stuck together we're either going to kill each other or we're going to increase in love we're going to scrounge in the food room and see what we got find out who can cook we're going to look for blankets we're going to increase in relationship and love for one another we're probably going to pray better than we've prayed in a while. Oh, Lord, i got to lay down over here next to Michael, and we've got to snuggle to keep warm because it's cold. Can I lay down next to you and put my arm around you? <laughs> it depends how cold you are. Paul thought so much of this church that he boasted about them to everybody else and he spoke about this church, about this church's growth. But we see here that this model, this church, this steadfastness, he spoke of their steadfastness of faith. He says, we boast about you in the churches for your steadfastness. Another idea for steadfastness. What's another word? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Steady. Steady. Enduring. Enduring. Consistent. What? Persistent. She stole your word, I know. <laughs> Perseverance. That's the one I was looking for. You can't Stop this growth. He said, I boast to other churches because you're so unstoppable in growth, in transformation, in faith, and love for one another. I've never seen another church like y'all. <clears throat> you're steadfast. You have a lot of faith. You have a lot of love. Oh. You have a lot of persecution and affliction. Anybody who was losing business, position, or power because their, their position for representing the Roman or Greek gods 
was now mad. You're stealing my livelihood. I'm not going to be able to make my house payment. I'm going to have to go from two hump camel to one hump camel. That's like a, from a nice car to an average car. You're stealing my money. I legitimately have a right to be mad at you. Now everybody's following you, not me. That offends me. I am who I am, and you can't, you shouldn't. I don't want you to take that away from me. I am a position of honor. I always feel, I always feel this guilt when I go and someone says, hey, reverend, or as one, I told you many times, one lady used to call me father. And I said, don't call me father. Okay, father. <laughs> we, we never, I never broke her that. Or, as I told you the story, one time I was sitting in a man's office and uh, sharing the gospel and telling our ministry, he said, God is so lucky to have you. I don't think God ever told me that. (laughs) And I said, I think you don't understand what you're saying. And he, about four times, he said, no, 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 you don't understand. I I know God is really lucky to have you. I said, I think you need to stop saying that. Or I'm going to have to leave before God kills you. (laughs) Or me. (laughs) Persecution. Afflictions. We see it in first, you should be quickly run over to First Thessalonians 1, 3. What did that say? One three. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Second Thessalonians 3, 5, Sue, what did it say? 3, 5? Yes. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. Okay, so Paul is talking about being faithful, stead, persevering, all the things we said in the love, in the faith of God, even when you're swimming, in that sense, upstream. The Thessalonians I put there did not react to their persecution, their affliction from the Roman Greek God representatives that were having their income stolen, they were having their position in society taken away, being exposed to being liars and deceivers and, and deceived and were getting mad and where they were coming physically, physically to beat them, to drag them before magistrates and say, throw these people in jail. They're turning the city upside down. We want, and, and if they didn't want to go that route, there's always the good street route. Let's just drag them down the street and beat them and stone them. And if we kill them, hallelujah, better yet. And we would, are going to harass wherever they meet, harass whoever meets, threaten them, scare them, bully them. And then you had the Jews show up And say, oh, these people came from our home and they're well known to be liars and thieves and hypocrites and deceivers. Don't listen to them. Their gospel is a lie. They're full of demons. These people were being attacked. And they did not run away from this discomfort. They did not shy away from the title of followers of Jesus Christ. They didn't quit the call. The church did not shut down. They viewed all their pressures as circumstances that God allowed. And as Paul taught them to perfect them. This is why 
the heavy persecution and affliction is why this church was an exemplary church. The church, like an individual that the Lord said, if he's too rich, you might as well try to shove a, 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 a camel through the eye of a needle. You might as well shove that Chevy 2500 through the eye of a needle. Ain't going to happen. James 1, 2 through 4. Their persecution was their redemption. It was their perfection. It was what made them strong, steadfast, persevering, enduring, long-suffering, strong. You know, if I gave you a backpack and I put 20 pounds in it, or if we put ankle weights of 10 pounds per leg, well, by the first of the end of the first week, second, third night, your legs would be cramping. And it'd feel like jelly. And you feel like, man, I can't do this. But by the end of your second week, you're starting to get a hold of it and say, yeah, I can do this. And then you come along here at the end of the fourth week and you add 10 more pounds on each leg and you repeat the process, you repeat the process. All it does is make you stronger. And that's really what persecution, trials, and tribulations do for us. James 2, uh, 1, 2 through 4. Somebody read that. It's in your notes. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Hallelujah, Lord, send me some trials, send me some tribulation. Lord, send me some persecution. Lord, send me some affliction. Lord, send me some bad times. Anybody praying that? Or is anybody praying, Lord, I want to be strong. Lord, I want to grow in faith, in love. I want to walk in your grace. Anybody praying that? Well, guess what you're praying? <laughs> Don't be surprised when it knocks on your door. They did not endure by their own strength. And this is the beauty of my brothers. You don't have to endure by your own strength. You have to endure because it's purposeful. Now, if you're not a child of God, you know what affliction and persecution gets you? Angry, defeated, broken, dead. Has no purpose for you. That's why all the, those who are not filled with the Spirit of God Fear hard times. Fear death. Fear trials and tribulations. We insulate our lives in any way we can to protect it from trials, tribulations, afflictions. He ever said, Lord, I think I might be closer to you if I were to break out with sores about half an inch deep, just oozing and bleeding. I think that might really drive me to you. Well, we don't want the source, but we want to be driven to the Lord. So what's your alternative? Get up, pursue the Lord. Afflictions are going to come. You're in the world. The prince of this world. The father of the children of men. He's a murderer. He's a hater. He's a robber. He destroys. He's going to come knocking on your door. To what degree God gives him opportunity to work will be in some sense to what degree 
you're striving to grow or not. God is going to, listen to me, this may be the most important thing I say tonight. God is going to perfect you to the very image of Jesus Christ because that's the deal you made. In your spirit, he did it at the cost of Jesus on the cross. In your soul, you get to pay that price. You have to surrender your heart, your mind, your body to the Lord and say, Lord, use me today. They did not grow and endure and survive the affliction, the tribulation by their own strength, but they were in love with the Lord. They were in love with one another. The agape of God caused them to draw close to God and caused them to draw close to one another. They had faith in God and they looked to him for the grace to bear up under the weight of affliction, to accept the circumstances with peace, knowing that they're for a time and realizing that God is glorified with your growth and your victory. And in the end, the greatest purpose of your life that you can ever live for and be rewarded for is to glorify the God of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ the Son, and God the Father in heaven. You have no greater purpose and meaning than that. And there will be no greater reward than that. Instead of the 12 foot John boat, you get the 36 foot yacht. <laughs> sort of speaking like in heaven. They were patiently enduring the persecution from the enemies of the gospel. He said, and I wrote in there, those who were hostile toward them. Did you read 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, Susan? Yes. No, I read. First 3 and 4? It's not in your notes. I read 3, not 4. Verse 3 and 4. Oh, you read verse 3? Yes. All right, read 3 and 4 again about enduring and persecution. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, and 4. No, 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4. Oh, is that a comforting verse? Read that for me again, Candy. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Did your king, your master, your Lord, your savior, was he destined for suffering affliction? And did he suffer it well? Did he suffer it and attain his purpose? Are you his disciple? Do you expect better? Yes. (laughs) For this, you were destined to glorify God. I I don't know if you all remember the one time I had uh, 
some kind, some kind of sciatic nerve issue in my back and leg. And I was in tremendous pain. And I had various people come over to my house and pray for me. And I had various people say, Rick, you need to get up and go to the ER. And the Holy Spirit said, no, Rick, don't go. Oh, it was painful. I could not lay still. I was just rolling from side to side. And I remember Kayla came over and prayed for me. You remember that? Do you remember what I said to you? I said to her, let me teach you how to suffer well. It's okay to be in agony and pain and suffer. It's okay. It's purposeful. It's for a moment. It passed in about three or four days, five days. All my granddaughters and grandchildren always need to get in on the video, so that's okay. There's, you can stay, Luke. Our troubles, pressures, trials, painful circumstances, whatever they come from, in their case, both Jew and Gentile, are purposeful. Don't cry. Oh, you can cry. It's okay to cry. Just don't despair. I gave you a couple of verses, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, that where they're talking about the Jews and Gentile, and the story is found in Acts 17, but we're not going to go there because I'm gonna, running out of time, and I'm not even going to get past what, my, what I did last week. Their persecution, their trials, we know were numerous. You can study that, see it in 17th chapter of Acts and in uh, verse 1 6 of 1 Thessalonians and 2 14 of 1 Thessalonians. Yet, in spite of all this trouble from the Jews, trouble from the Gentile, trouble from the civic leaders, trouble from the religious leader, trouble from the common man. In spite of all the trouble, the Thessalonians kept growing. They were strong. They were stable. They kept adding to their numbers. They kept rejoicing. They had joy, love, and peace with one another. My brothers, the trials are in the physical realm. By the Spirit of God, you have the agape love and you have the joy and the peace of your spirit. And let your flesh scream, ouch, that hurts bad. But let your spirit sing, the Lord is upon me. And he is greater than that which is afflicting me in the flesh of this world. My days are numbered, so the afflictions are numbered. Come death, it's okay. My reward is written on my, heart, my forehead the one day when I will go to the Lord. I will be rewarded. It is not for nothing. It is not lost. We are destined to be perfected. And by our nature, we're perfected better by trials than we are by blessings. Sometimes our blessings cause us to forget God, and sometimes our trials make us mad at God. But the trials are generally going to have more impact on us than the good times. So now we go to verse 5. Let's cover a new verse in the last 10 minutes. Somebody read verse 5. Oh, this verse is confusing. I read it about three or four times, and I go, I don't think I understand this. 
the verse, you know, as I started putting things together. This is evidence, talking about the trials and tribulations, the afflictions. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God for you, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. There's three thoughts in here that we're going to try to break out. But first thought I, I thought of is that the gospel speaks of living worthy for the Lord's calling. And I just pulled out one, Matthew 10, 37, 38. Whoever loves father and mother more than me and is, not, is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son, daughter, more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You know, if Jesus says three times, is not worthy of me, you're not worthy of me, you're not worthy of me, and he gives you three examples, we should get the idea that he expects us to live worthy of him by the choices we make and how we live. He's calling us to account. There is a way to live that is worthy of being called children of God. There is a, a way to live that is worthy of going into the kingdom of heaven. There is a way to live that, is, that, that determines our worth to be saved, children of God. Paul used this concept. I know he got it from the Lord, and he used it in Ephesians 4, 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you have received, which you have been called, Ephesians 4, 1. Colossians 1, 9, 10. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to, you're going to get all this, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's an expectation of those who are of Christ walk in a way that demonstrate that they are worthy to be called disciples of the Lord, children of God, citizens of heaven. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, we exhort each one of you and encourage you and charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is not a cheap prosperity gospel. This is not a free cheap, as it were, when you receive the grace. It was free to receive the grace. But it comes with a transformation, a change on those who receive it. Paul encouraged the Thessalonians, I'm on page three, in their difficult experience by reminding them that God is just. He knows what's going on. He knows you're being persecuted. He knows you're being afflicted. He knows you're being, uh, you're, you're under trial and tribulation. He's watching. He's close. And he makes sure that it does not become unjust. That's easy because we all sinned. And the wages of sin is death. We all learned trial, tribulation, persecution, affliction, and death. We all learned it. So it is not unjust that we experience some of that. We earned it. So God is just. He's righteous. His judgment, his justness, his righteousness will reward them and punish the wicked. Anybody knows what Galatians 6, 7 says? right there in front of you yes do not be deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever you sow you do that you will also reap anybody know second Peter 2 no this is the last look up scripture 
2 Peter 2, verse 1 through 7 says, that's not in your notes, you could add it to if you want to. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 7, but false prophets arose among them, among the people, just that there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensualities. Because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you and with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. Their condemnation, their destruction. It's not idle and it's not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, and that's a whole other sermon, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness. Oh, man, how do you like to be down there with them? And that never changes. To be kept until the judgment if he did not spare the ancient world, you had Lot destroyed by fire. You had the world destroyed by water except for Noah. But preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to execution, extinction, excuse me, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Oh, that's hard. That's a hard saying. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly stressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day to day, he was tormented, tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deed that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly man from trial. You hear that? The godly man, the ungodly man, not so good. He knows how to rescue the godly man from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. Oh, you should underline despise authority. That's bold and common. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Anyway, we're going to stop there. It talks about how we judged and judged and judged. Who here can send a wicked man to hell? Who here can torment a wicked man relentlessly forever in darkness, in the fire and brimstones, in the loneliness, in the dryness, in the hopelessness? This is the just work of God to punish the wicked. And it is his glory and his righteous work to save the righteous. When God does judge the Thessalonians, he would see that they were steadfast and faithful in the faith and that they loved one another. And the grace of the Lord abounded in them. And he would see that, and he will declare that you lived worthy of my calling. In fact, is there not somewhere about well done? Well done, Julia. Well done, Anita. Well done, Brandy. So you all ain't used to hearing that, are you? Probably aren't many of us. Well done. You're good. You're faithful. You're servant of God.
God would declare them worthy of his kingdom by the demonstrated grace and power of the Holy Spirit in them that separated them from those who suffered under wickedness. Those who suffer under righteousness get good from it. Those who suffer under wickedness just get wickedness. And then those who suffered under righteousness will be rescued. And that's coming up in the next teaching, what the rescue looks like. And those who are faithful, are righteous, walk with God now through the fire. Remember the furnace fire? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember that furnace fire? Trial and tribulation. Three went in, four walked around. Remember Daniel and the lion's den? God made kitty cats out of them. <laughs> we do not walk without provision of strength of grace, faith. And we do not walk without provision of relationship with Jesus, his spirit, and one another. We're blessed. Endurance in trials doesn't make you worthy of heaven. You don't earn heaven. This is a Catholic concept paying penance and so they walk around and they take whips and they whip themselves till they bleed there's some guys who have themselves nailed crucified to boards and hang for a time others starve others get beaten others are chained to try to pay penance in some way to make payment but you know a dog trying to turn into a man will always be a dog. He's just a dog. A sinner will always be a sinner. You can't, if you sinned, even if you could live perfectly righteous from age five up, that last year of four and five, I have grandchildren. Yeah, they know what they're doing. Even that last year, of say at, from 10 and down. Even if you lived righteously after that, you still can't eliminate your sin. You must pay for what you have already done. Even if you could be perfect from now on, but we somehow haven't managed, haven't managed that because we carry our old nature. But we're sinning less and less, but we still must pay for sin or Jesus must pay for sin. Suffering does not bring you righteousness. It does not demonstrate that you're a good person to suffer. It does not demonstrate that you're worthy. And I'll even go so far as to say suffering in and of itself is not good. It is the consequence of our fallen world. A Christian or a person of Christ is made worthy by Christ, given his righteousness upon us, his grace received freely when we surrender to Christ, to the Lord. Our trials simply expose that we have within us the grace of and the faith to exist in them. This is not really much of a trial, but it was a circus when Monday the stormed and we had all that rain come running in. And I was doing counseling with a couple in my office and under my door came this water literally running and it kept coming and coming and coming until it filled my room and the room was half an inch deep in water and I just lifted my feet up and said, let's keep counseling. And they're looking around like, oh, no. <laughs> so 
So we kept counseling. I said, just lift your shoes up, your feet up. I put my shoes on. And then when we got through counseling, then I opened the door and I started making calls for y'all. Hey, come help. I said, let's go buy some wet vat, blah, 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 blah. And let's buy some pizza while we're at it. Have a little celebration. Trials are always external. Peace is internal. Grace and strength is internal. If Lily come up and punch me in the back of the head really hard, she might be known for that. And if you're walking in the grace and freedom of the Lord, his peace in you, you're going to get a knot. But she can't stir up what's not there. Anger. Can't stir it up if it's not there. But if she just gives me a look and anger's there, it's all I need. We demonstrate what is in us. And that demonstrated is what declares that you are worthy of the kingdom of God. That you have received the grace of Jesus Christ, the freedom of, of sin by his righteousness upon your spirit, the Holy Spirit living within you, his God's heart and mind transformed into you. Those are your badges, as it were, that say, I am living for the Son of God. And it produces the actions of the Son of God from within you. And God said, that person is worthy of the calling I put on them. That person is worthy of the kingdom of God because they produce the fruit of my spirit. They look like my son. Your character emerges under fire. And God's going to expose the character that's there. So through Christ and his provision, it's possible for us to withstand the fires, hard experiences, which destroys non-Christians, but just demonstrates we're children of God. And I just threw this in. The kingdom of God is God's rule. So they brought glory to God. Because they held up. They demonstrated who they were. Somewhere, someone said you'll know them by their... Who, who said that? Who? Who? Who said that? Who? Jesus? Yes, you're right. Jesus said that. She goes, shoo. I thought so. Jesus said that. I know who you are by what comes out of you. Good fruit produces, I mean, good tree produces good fruit. Bad tree produces bad fruit. Bad fruit is not worthy, is not a worthy demonstration. Good fruit is a worthy demonstration. Hey Amen. I passed the, my deadline. Sorry. Let's pray. Go ahead and turn me off, Lilia. Wake up. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we, we say, Lord, whatever it takes, we must be 